Business is battle. On Business Wars, we learn what it takes to win by closely looking at ambitious battles like our latest series, Vaccine Wars. And our new book, The Art of Business Wars, gets to the very heart of each conflict, unearthing all the valuable lessons. Go to Wondery.com slash The Art of Business Wars to order your copy now. Join Wondery Plus to listen to Business Wars one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. January 3rd, 2020, Shanghai, China. 44 infections, 11 seriously ill. A motorbike courier zooms down the road towards the plain gray building of the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center. He pulls up at the entrance and races inside carrying a metal case covered in biohazard signs. I have an urgent delivery for Professor Zhang Yang Zhang. It's from Wuhan. Zhang is one of China's foremost virologists, an expert in decoding the genetics of previously unknown pathogens. A mysterious illness is spreading in the city of Wuhan in central China, and it's Zhang's job to identify the culprit. The case is rushed to a biosecure room in Zhang's lab. Inside the room, a technician in a hazmat suit opens it and carefully lifts out a test tube. It's a sample of lung fluid from a 41-year-old hospital patient in Wuhan. Zhang and his team work non-stop for the next 40 hours to isolate the virus and piece together its genetic makeup. Finally, at 2 a.m. on January 5th, one of the team calls Zhang over to his computer. On the screen are the letters A, C, G, and U, repeated over and over in various combinations the letters that spell out the virus's genetic code. Genome complete, Zhang calls the head of respiratory medicine at Wuhan Central Hospital. We have the genome. It's a previously unknown coronavirus that's closely related to SARS. On the other end of the line, the hospital doctor goes quiet. The 2003 SARS outbreak killed more than 800 people. Is it more dangerous than SARS? We don't know yet. But it's certainly more dangerous than influenza. You and your staff should take precautions. Quarantine patients. How many cases are there? Fifty-nine. The two men fall silent as the seriousness of this outbreak dawns on them. In the two days it's taken Zhang's team to decode the virus, the number of infections has jumped 34%. If the virus keeps spreading at this rate, There will be almost 500 cases next week and thousands more before the month is over. For years, scientists warned that a global pandemic was a question of when, not if. They called this future killer Disease X. And right now, both Zhang and the doctor believe they're looking at a strong contender, a disease with the potential to change the trajectory of human civilization forever. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. When the coronavirus pandemic began, a safe and effective vaccine seemed years away. The average vaccine takes a decade to research, develop, and test, and only 6% reach the market. For the coronavirus, the best case scenario was that a vaccine might arrive in late 2021. Instead, it took just under a year. In our new series, we follow the drug industry's unprecedented race against time to deliver a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. It's a scramble to save lives. It's also a bid for a stake in a global COVID-19 vaccine market that could be worth $100 billion a year. The challenges are enormous. 
contenders must make scientific breakthroughs, supersize their manufacturing, and wrestle with devilish distribution logistics, all in a toxic U.S. political climate. And just as the deadly virus takes more lives and pushes society to the brink, it mutates. More than a hundred companies will enter this race, but only four become front runners. American drug giant Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech, big pharma player Johnson & Johnson, biotech startup Moderna, and the British tag team of AstraZeneca and Oxford University. This is episode one. This is not a drill. January 11th, 2020, Shanghai, China. Chinese virologist Zhang Yongzheng boards his plane to Beijing and pushes his way towards his seat. It's a packed flight. Around him, passengers jostle for overhead bin space and sit shoulder to shoulder in cramped seats. Sorry, thanks, excuse me. It's been six days since Zhang's lab mapped the genome of the virus now known as SARS-CoV-2. In Wuhan, the virus is spreading unabated. Respiratory wards in the city's hospitals are hurtling toward their breaking point. But not even Zhang realizes that soon, flights like this will turn from humdrum to horrifying. As Zhang squeezes into his seat, his phone rings. It's Edward Holmes, a University of Sydney virologist and collaborator. Edward, listen, I'm on a plane that's about to take off. Can, can this wait? I'll be quick. I want to publish the genome of that new virus online. No one can make treatments, tests, or vaccines until they have it. We're completely powerless right now, and that scares me. If this is anything like SARS, we need to act. A flight attendant stops at Zhang's seat. Sir, we're taxiing to the runway. You must hang up. Uh, just finishing, just finishing. Edward, it, it's done already. I filed the genome with the U.S. National Repository. Those guys take weeks to look at anything. We need the genome out there right now. Let me publish it. Zhang pauses. China's government is clamping down on information about the outbreak. The authorities might be unhappy if he releases the genome without permission. But he knows Holmes is right. Delay means more deaths. The flight attendant crosses her arms. Sir, you need to end your call now. Zhang replies to Holmes. <laughs> Do it. As Zhang's plane takes off, Holmes posts the genome on the scientific research hub virological.org. Soon, alerts are pinging the devices of virus researchers across the world. The race to beat the coronavirus is on. But far from catching virologists off guard, some already have their running shoes on. Early Friday evening, Boston, Massachusetts, less than an hour after the genome's publication. Dr. Dan Baruch enters his office at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Baruch runs the center's vaccine research lab. He sits down at his computer to catch up on emails. An alert about a new post on virological.org lands in his inbox. Baruch opens it. It's the genome for the new coronavirus. He raises his eyebrow at the coincidence. Earlier today, he was on an annual retreat with his research team. They agreed to use the coronavirus to test how quickly they could make a vaccine. They figured it would be a useful academic exercise that might support their ongoing mission to make an HIV vaccine. And now that the genomes arrived, the test can begin. But right now, he has no idea that this virus will soon be joining HIV and ending the lives of millions. Baruch emails his team. Just got that coronavirus genome. Time to make a vaccine. But Baruch's lab is just one of dozens tooling up to respond. And just across the Charles River in Cambridge, Massachusetts, an ambitious biotech company is also answering the call. Moderna has raised hundreds of millions of dollars of investment on the promise that its technology will shake up the drug trade. That technology 
is messenger RNA, strands of genetic material that promise a future where creating a new medicine will be as easy as writing computer code. It's an idea exciting enough to push Moderna's value to $45 billion. But it's still a small fish in the pharmaceutical pond. Moderna employs 800 people. Global drug giant Pfizer employs 88,000. So far, Moderna hasn't delivered a single product to market in its 10-year existence. But the coronavirus is about to change all that. It's 7 p.m., and in Moderna's head office, Hamilton Bennett is working late. Bennett is the company's 34-year-old partnerships director, and she's about to join a video call with the U.S. government's Vaccine Research Center. She pushes her black shoulder-length hair behind her ears and logs on. A man with a silver goatee appears on the screen. He's Barney Graham, the 60-something deputy director of the Vaccine Center. The center supports research into vaccines, And last fall, it agreed to help Moderna test how quickly its technology could deliver a vaccine in a hypothetical pandemic scenario. Good evening, Hamilton. Hey there, Barney. You wanted to run through the details of our pandemic drill? Yes, but the genome for that coronavirus in China just came out. I think we should start the drill now using that. Bennett didn't expect to begin the exercise right away, but she figures that actual pandemics don't give notice either. Besides, it's not Moderna's style to shy away from a challenge. Of course. Excellent. Kismikia Corbett heads our coronavirus work. She'll be your main contact. Her team will take the lead on identifying the virus's spike protein. Like all coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is a sphere covered in protruding spike proteins that resemble golf tees. The virus uses these spikes to latch onto and invade cells. Then, it converts those cells into virus-producing factories. It's critical for any vaccine to teach the immune system to hunt down and destroy these telltale spike proteins. Bennett nods. Okay, while we're waiting on the spike protein data, I'll prep our team. Great. I think this will be a useful training exercise all around. But this test won't be a practice run for long. It's January 19th, and the global elite are converging on the Swiss ski resort of Davos for the World Economic Forum. Outside, it's snowing. But in the warm bars inside, world leaders, tycoons, celebrities, and activists are dreaming up visions of tomorrow's world. And in one of these bars is Moderna CEO Stefan Bonsell. He's wearing designer glasses and a black turtleneck. He listens as a European immunologist gives his take on the coronavirus. That thing has pandemic written all over it. Bonsell interrupts. China says it's no SARS, though. The immunologist gets out his phone. Hang on. I I got this from my contacts in Wuhan. The immunologist shows Bansell his phone. On the screen is a graph with a line that's shooting up like a space rocket. That's the number of new cases every day. Bansell looks at the immunologist. You said this could be a pandemic? That's a strong possibility. This virus is so contagious it must be transmitting person to person, most likely by air. Now, 11 million people live in Wuhan. That's more than in New York City. Chances are this virus has already spread far beyond Wuhan. Bansell gulps. If this guy's right, it changes everything. The next day in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Moderna's top people are in the conference room. Bansell has called an emergency meeting from Davos. As the team listens... Bansell addresses them via the speakerphone on the table. From what I've learned here, this new coronavirus looks destined to become a pandemic. Put aside everything you're working on. Accelerate trials and start prepping for mass production. Our little vaccine project isn't theoretical anymore. It's real. One concerned executive interrupts. Stefan, are you sure we should do this? It'll put all our projects behind schedule and cost millions. Don't forget the hit we took making that Zika vaccine, and then the outbreak fizzled before we could get it into trials. 
A pandemic is coming. Do you understand? We have to get ahead of this today, not tomorrow. Okay. How about we do it, but reassess a couple of months in? Moderna's head of manufacturing shakes his head. Sorry, guys. Scaling up manufacturing isn't something you just switch on and off. If we're in, we're all in. Vaccine Partnerships Director Hamilton Bennett pipes up. Listen, we all know that our mRNA technology is uniquely capable of responding to a viral pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Yes, it is. Well, if we don't do this, maybe no one will. We know we can do this. So morally, we have to. Bansell replies. Exactly. This could be an inflection point for us. A chance to scale up fast and show the world what we can do. And that's what we're going to do. There's a ripple of excitement among the team. There's a killer virus out there and they're up for the challenge of stopping it. But they also know this is high risk. Moderna's never brought a drug to market before and it'll cost at least a billion dollars to launch a vaccine. Failure could destroy the company's credibility. But Moderna has faith in its science and the team is certain they can rise to the challenge. The company sprints into action. Its researchers work round the clock developing prototype vaccines. Its production team starts buying the extra equipment it'll need to mass produce doses. And in Davos, Bansell secures millions in funding from a nonprofit to pay for the initial work on the vaccine. Moderna is moving fast, but the virus is moving faster. Recently, I needed to schedule a consultation for a project. Called the business, got a recorded menu so long I lost the plot. Sound familiar? Figured I could schedule something online, but felt like my request just went into a black hole. Would I hear back? How soon? If there were a way, I could just text someone there and get some basic answers now. Huh. Well, you know, it's hard to deny how powerful the convenience of texting really is when it comes to people choosing where to take their business. I know firsthand. And Podium is the messaging platform to power your business because it helps you reach your customers wherever they are. Business messaging with Podium doesn't just help you communicate with your customers. It also helps you gain reviews, collect payments, capture leads, all from a single inbox. Listen to these glowing endorsements. South Tampa Family and Cosmetic Dentistry collected nearly 1,200 reviews averaging 4.9 stars and said, The number of walk-ins as a result of our reviews has skyrocketed. Before, we were seeing maybe 50 to 100 new patients a month. Now we're seeing closer to 200. Or this one from the Bridal Collection. They processed over 200,000 no-contact payments. The owner said, we don't have to take credit cards into the store. We can do it completely remotely. Podium has been a godsend for us in this journey. Well, now you can find out how Podium can help your business reach more customers. Get started free today at podium.com slash bw. That's podium.com slash bw. (laughs) 10 p.m., January 20th, Snohomish County, Washington, about 30 miles from Seattle. Outside a suburban home, ambulance lights are flashing and medics are putting on hazmat suits. Inside the house, a man in his mid-30s watches through the window. He's just become the first known coronavirus case in America, and he can't believe this is happening to him. He returned from Wuhan last week feeling fine, but yesterday he got a fever. His doctor told him to stay home and sent a nasal swab to the CDC in Atlanta for tests. Three hours ago, the CDC confirmed he's got SARS-CoV-2. The medics wheel a transparent plastic cocoon on a gurney into the house. The patient stares at the contraption. What is that? It's an isopod. We're going to take you to the hospital in it. It prevents the virus from escaping. Don't worry, the hospital has a biocontainment room, so as soon as you're in there, you can get out. The man lies on the gurney his eyes flitting around in fear as they zip the isopod shut and switch on the air filtration system. The medic tries to calm the man. I know it seems dramatic, but right now we don't know how contagious this virus is, so we're taking maximum precautions. But I'll be with you the whole way, 
It's only a short ride. As the man is whisked away, public health officials race to find everyone he's had contact with since returning to the U.S. And as the U.S. faces its first case, China's taking drastic steps. Breaking news of unprecedented action in China to contain the new coronavirus. Wuhan, which is the city right at the epicenter of the outbreak and two nearby cities in the central region, they are now in transport lockdown, effectively in quarantine, with no buses, no trains, no flights allowed in or out. The threat is swelling by the hour. The Chinese government is scrambling to contain the disease, but it's already turning up in cities all over the nation. Cases are also being found in Australia, Japan, Canada, and Sri Lanka. And with the danger rising, Moderna and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center aren't going to be alone in their race to beat the virus for long. In Europe, two more teams of scientists are about to join the fight, and they're moving just as fast as their rivals across the Atlantic. January 10th, Mainz, Germany. It's Monday morning, and at the headquarters of BioNTech, an all-hands meeting is underway. At the front of the room are the company's husband and wife founders, CEO Uhur Shaheen and his wife, Aslam Turaj, the chief medical officer. They started BioNTech in 2008. Like Moderna, BioNTech wants to use mRNA to reinvent medicine. Its ultimate goal is to make personalized cancer drugs but it's about to pivot. Shaheen, a skinny man with a friendly face and a Turkish Naza amulet around his neck, puts his hands into the pocket of his lab coat. He might be a CEO, but he's a scientist, first and foremost. This weekend, I read a paper about the coronavirus outbreak that suggests this virus spreads person to person even when people don't feel ill. That means asymptomatic carriers are spreading the virus unknowingly. So I believe this will be a pandemic. A ripple of unease runs through the team. Shaheen and Turaj know their stuff. If they think a pandemic's coming, it's probably going to happen. Since our mRNA technology is ideal for making vaccines, Aslam and I have decided that we must now put our all into making one. Turaj steps forward and adjusts her big round glasses. We are reorganizing the lab staff into small teams. The teams will work in a shift pattern to ensure constant progress. There will also be no physical contact between different teams so that if anyone catches the virus, disruption will be minimal. Non-lab staff will now work from home. We advise you to avoid public transport. We're also canceling vacations. One employee objects. But I'm going skiing next week. Please don't do that. Ski resorts are an ideal place for the virus to spread. All those people from so many countries converging in one place. Look, I I know this is a big ask, but as scientists in this field, we have a duty to act. An employee raises his hand. What if the disease just fizzles out? Shaheen smiles. Then I will look foolish, and you can say I told you so. But I'd rather be wrong than do nothing. But while the BioNTech team is just starting, another team of scientists is already sprinting ahead. And they've got a vaccine ready to go. January 30th, 2020, Oxford, England. In a modern wedge-shaped building, Oxford University's medical researchers are discussing what they can do to help stop the coronavirus. The university's head of medicine scans the faces of the scientists around the table. Does anyone have anything that could be deployed immediately? A red-haired woman with a determined expression on her face speaks up. She's Professor Sarah Gilbert, a vaccine specialist at the university's Jenner Institute lab. Yes, we already have a vaccine. There's a moment of stunned silence. Gilbert straightens her black-framed glasses and elaborates. We started work the moment the genome came out earlier this month. By the end of the weekend, we had designed several vaccine candidates. Another professor interrupts. How? Don't you need the actual virus to make a vaccine? The old approach of using weakened forms of a target virus is no longer necessary. 
we use a viral vector approach. The vector is a genetically modified chimpanzee cold virus that is harmless and cannot replicate. We then edit its DNA so that it causes cells to produce the spike proteins of SARS-CoV-2. Those proteins then provoke the immune response needed to protect against the actual coronavirus. Is this a proven approach? We used it to create a MERS vaccine that entered trials in December, but we've spent over a decade honing this technology. We're confident it will work. Sensing she's got the room's full attention, Gilbert seizes the moment. The next stage is to run animal trials and then small human safety trials, but there are costs involved, like manufacturing doses for those trials and getting the lab set up and we need technicians and extra. I mean, the manufacturing costs are going to... The head of medicine cuts to the chase. How much money do you need to keep this going until external funding can be secured? Uh, a million pounds. Done. Gilbert smiles. But she knows that a million pounds won't last for long. Bringing a vaccine to market will cost hundreds of millions of dollars in clinical trials, manufacturing, and distribution. Finding a way to foot that bill is a challenge for all the frontrunners in the vaccine race. Investors regard vaccines as a low-margin backwater of the pharmaceutical business. Why gamble billions trying to make vaccines that people take just once when you could make drugs for chronic conditions that people will take daily for years on end? But as the vaccine makers worry about financing, the virus is pushing forward. At the beginning of January, fewer than 50 people had the coronavirus. Now, it's the end of the month, and there are nearly 8,000 known cases. The virus is now present throughout mainland China and popping up in countries across the world. The World Health Organization has officially declared it a global health emergency. But this killer's only getting started. On the next episode, one woman's perseverance in the face of insurmountable odds is the key to giving us a fighting chance to stop the coronavirus. And a slick French businessman bets big on a scrappy company called Moderna. From Wondery, this is episode one of Vaccine Wars for Business Wars. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey and tell us which business stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they are based on historical research. I'm your host, David Brown. Tristan Donovan wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Voice acting by Michelle Philippi. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our producer is Dave Schilling. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering.